So Psalm 21 is where we will focus our attention today. I invite you, if you would, to stand as I read the word of God. To the choir master, a psalm of David. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your salvation how greatly he exults. You have given him his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. Selah. For you meet him with rich blessings and you set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. You make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord and through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Your hand will find out your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants with the earth and their offspring from among the children of man. Though they plot evil against you, Though they devise mischief, they will not succeed, for you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. Let's pray. Lord, we come now to receive and to hear your word. I pray that we will praise you as we learn from you that we will praise you as we see you revealed in your word, that we will praise you in response to your word. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can be seated. So I'm going to ask a question that a lot of wives have asked through the years, even some men. Why do we watch sports? I know some of you have no idea and wonder why a human being would give themselves to it. Some people would argue it's fan loyalty, that we're committed to a team. Here's why we watch sports. We watch sports because we like to see people win. This is why people get on the bandwagon. Right now, everybody's on the Alabama Clemson bandwagon because they're winning. You know, what happened to the UNC fans? So you'll reemerge in basketball, see? Because you win. See, I went to Wake Forest. We never win. A field goal is all we ever get. <laughs> we love to see a win. We love to see it at the last minute. We love to see the underdog pull it out. We, we enjoy victory. This is, this is how God made us. Even, even the calmest person, you give the right circumstance. You let some little grandchild score a goal or a touchdown, even the most reserved grandparent. Yeah. We like to see it. So here's the point of this song. The strength of the Lord displayed in Christ the King is our joy. And the strength of the Lord displayed in Christ is victory. And it is our joy joy. Some of you grew up learning this song. Some of you despised its repetition. The joy of the Lord is my strength. That's actually not in the Bible. That was a combination of putting verses together used out of the Psalms. I would argue that the, that the song should have been written this way. It should have been written. The strength of the Lord is our joy. Because that's actually what the Bible's teaching. That we find our joy in the strength of the Lord. This is to the choir master, a Psalm of David. It is paired together on purpose with Psalm 20. Psalm 20 is a pre-battle or a pre-victory prayer. It begins in Psalm 20 verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of of the God of Jacob protect you. Verse nine, O Lord, save the king or deliver the king. May he answer us when we call. Now that flows into Psalm 21, 
which is now a post battle or a celebration of victory. And we see two big truths as we look at this text. First, the Lord's strength prompts glad rejoicing. O Lord, in your strength, the king rejoices and in your salvation, how greatly he exalts. Verse one. Now let's notice right off, David is identifying the Lord God, Lord, capital L-O-R-D. It's a pet peeve of mine. When, when you are writing the name of God, the proper name of God, it is capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is his name. It means something slightly different than capital L, lowercase o-r-d. That's acknowledging that he is Lord over us. Capital L-O-R-D is saying he's Lord over us, but more than that, he is the covenant-keeping, self-revealing God. This is the name he gave himself. And that's who he's speaking to here. This God, this covenant-keeping God who's revealed himself, he says, in your strength, in the strength of Yahweh, in the strength of God, the king rejoices. In your salvation, how greatly he exalts. Now, the word exalt, we use the word exalt sometimes. The word exalt means to express great joy. So a person is exalting when they express tremendous joy. So, so let's think of the Auburn fans a couple years ago the field goal that was not. Alabama kicks the field goal, the guy catches in the end zone, runs it for a touchdown, and the Auburn Stadium absolutely exults. They erupt into an expression of great joy. Now that wasn't enough for David. He piles one more word on it. He says he greatly expresses great joy. He says, you... Yahweh have given him, the king, his heart's desire. And look back in verse four of chapter 20. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. So here's what he's saying in, in chapter 21. God's done this. Now, I have a question. Some people want to take the Bible and say, well, this is what it means to me, or this is what the Lord led me to this mean. Listen, the Lord had a meaning when he wrote the Bible. There's an intention behind all of the word. There's an intention in this text. You can't extract verse four and use it as you see fit. This does not mean, may he grant your heart's desire that he would grant you whatever you wish. What it means is, May he grant what he wanted, that is to fulfill all your plans and not withhold the request of his lips, Selah. So, so David wants you to pause right here and to think, what's he talking about? Look in chapter two of Psalm. This is a foundational Psalm. All of the Psalms are understood in right relationship to Psalms one and Psalm two. Psalm two Verse eight says, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. And here's what he's saying. The Lord has not withheld that request from the king. It, it is the Lord who bestows on his servant great gifts. Now verse three begins to describe these. For you meet him with rich blessings and set a crown of fine gold upon his head. Now, this is the royal blessings given to the king, rightly deserved and rightly bestowed and honored on him. He asked life of you and you gave it to him, length of days forever and ever. And what's that describing? It's describing eternal life. That's not just describing somebody who needed to get better or to get healed from a sickness. It is life that is given forevermore. His glory is great through your salvation or your deliverance, splendor and majesty you bestow on him. So 
the way in which this king is delivered brings great glory. Splendor and majesty are bestowed on him because of the way he is delivered. Because of the way he is delivered, you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Now in verse six, David here takes the three major covenants that Yahweh has made and summarizes them in one verse. He said, what do you mean? He says to, to Abraham in Genesis 12, verse two, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Verse six, you make him most blessed forever. God promised it, he's done it. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Now, 2 Samuel 7, 16 speaks directly. This is God's covenant with David. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever. Your throne shall be established forever. And then there's an overtone of God's promise to Moses. What does God promise Moses and the children of Israel? That he will go before them and behind them. That they will not lack his presence that he will lead them out of Egypt and that he will establish the land. Derek Kidner said of these verses in the Psalms, the New Testament has filled in the picture firmly with a figure of the ultimate king, Jesus the Messiah, from whom the whole stanza is true without any exaggeration. You meet him with rich, rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked of you and you gave it to him length of days forever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. You make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Now here's the question. How, how did God do this? Christ came, fully God, fully man lived a sinless life, predicted over and over again that he was going to Jerusalem, he was going to be handed over, he was going to be beaten, be crucified, and three days rise again. The day before, the night before, he went to Gethsemane and he prayed. And God granted his prayer because what was his prayer? Not my will, but your will. That your will be done. Shortly thereafter, he was crowned, not with gold, but with thorns. He was crowned with thorns and taken and pierced and placed on a cross. This will make more sense next week with Psalm 22. And he suffered the agony of the cross, not only the physical death, Christ suffered and died in our place by taking the penalty of our sin upon him the perfect sacrifice for us. As a result, Paul describes it this way in Romans chapter one, verses three and four. Now watch Paul go back and appeal to places like Psalm 21. He says, concerning his son who was descended from David. So what's he saying? There was a promise to the son of David who was descended from David according to the flesh, was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Christ paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. Three days later, he rose from the grave. Christ is resurrected and is exalted and is now seated at the right hand of the Father. He will return to judge the living and the dead. He will usher in his eternal kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, which will endure forever and forever. All who are in Christ will know his eternal joy in the presence of almighty God. But here's what's true. That joy for the believer is not only forever, it is now. It is an understanding of the knowledge of the deliverance that has been given to the Son of God. One of the old guys wrote, 
The scriptures do not repress or discourage the highest religious emotions. We have divine authority for rejoicing greatly and for being exceedingly glad. We may rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. So I just will let some of you know something. There will be no passive observers in heaven. There will not be. There'll be no back row. No offense to those of you sitting on a back row. There will not be a place to where you can just watch. Heaven will be a place for those who are fully engaged. Who comprehend what has been done, what has been accomplished, and that accomplishment has changed them forevermore. And here's what's true. It's not their accomplishment. There's nothing that we do that we will be joyful over in heaven. It is God's grace alone manifested in Jesus Christ, which is the source of our joy now and will be the source of our joy forever. And before I transition into this next point, I just want to ask you a question. When someone sees and rejoices in the fulfillment of the Lord's ability and faithfulness to keep his promises through Christ, when you see that what happened in Christ was God's promise, how does that influence how you live now? Here's what it did to the king. The Lord's strength produces confident trust. For the king trusts in the Lord and through the steadfast love of the most high, he shall not be moved. So because of what the Lord has promised and because of the way that the Lord has kept his covenant, the promise that is yet to be through the steadfast love of the most high, the king shall not be moved. Why? Because he trusts the Lord to do what he says. Now here's what David is doing. Now notice this. The king trusts in the Lord through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. David's talking about somebody else here. He's not going to be moved. Now watch how Luke ties this together when he describes the explanation to Mary that she's about to have a baby. Listen. Listen. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob and his kingdom of his kingdom. There shall be no end. So what's what's being said to Mary? The fulfillment is conceived in your womb. The one who will win the ultimate victory, the one to whom all of the kingdom will be given to which it will not end will last forever. Now, here's what I want you to think about. This is what trips people up on Christianity. Sometimes we don't think through it clearly. But pause for a moment. We're in a royal psalm. We're in a victory psalm. How did God bring this victory to be? Christ came in humility. Born from a peasant woman. In an obscure place. He came in humility to carry out the plan of the Most High God for the salvation of souls. He completed the work of redemption on the cross and through the power of the resurrection. But that's not the end of the story. He is coming again. Now the psalm shifts. The psalm shifts from talking about this future victory of deliverance to the ultimate victory. And that is the coming of the king. Verse eight. 
Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. Let's read that one more time. I'm just letting it sit on you for a second. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand, this is the hand of authority, will find out those who hate you. After the first service, I was out in the lobby. There was a bunch of kids, I'd say kindergarten age or so. And one of them ran over and said, Pastor, we're playing hide and seek. Now, I don't know if you've been in the lobby much, but I was like, y'all aren't doing very good. I see you. When I'm gonna hide behind my little table. That's an illustration of those of you who think you're hiding from Almighty God. You're just children imagining something in your mind that is not true. God sees you. You say, who's an enemy of God? Here's the truth of the Bible. All who reject Christ the Son are enemies of God. You say, well, I, you know, I, I don't know if I believe that. Maybe you're, you're one of those people who want to appeal now and say, you know, you're in the Old Testament. You're not preaching New Testament. Okay, then I'll go preach in the New Testament. Turn to 2 Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians is written to a group of suffering Christians who are asking this question. If, if, if we're really Christians, why is God letting us suffer? Shouldn't this stop? Paul's given an answer. It's going to stop. It's just not going to stop when you think it's going to stop or how you think it's going to stop. Here's the answer. This is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God. This is not just judgment. This is the right judgment. This is the right thing for God to do. That you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay those, to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to those who are afflicted as well as to us. When? So here's when. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among those who believe because our testimony to you was believed marveled at among those who believe. What's the marvel going to be? On one side, the marvel is going to be reflected back at us that that we've been saved. This is going to be such a cataclysmic, incredible moment. The grace of God is going to be more evident to us than ever that God would save us. Here's the other marvel. that his right hand finds out everybody who hates him. Everybody. There's a false idea going on right now, and and it may be you sitting in this room today. There's a false idea that as long as I'm religious, I'm fine. Do do you understand this? That, that, That in the United States, church attendance, connection to organized Christianity, organized religion altogether is on a decline. It's going down. However, when they survey people, what's going up at an all-time high is the claim of Americans to be religious. They're happening simultaneously. Romans describes this. This is what's happening. People are defining God for themselves. In fact, they found who God is. me. It's whatever I say God is. It's whatever I want to think he is. And as long as I'm sincere, I'm okay. Here's what Psalm 2, I mean Psalm 21, Psalm 2, 2 Thessalonians, the whole Bible. That's what it's teaching. If you are against Jesus, you are against God. God. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That simple statement parts Christianity from the modern pluralistic world that we live in. And it is those words that bring about the anger of people, the angst of people. So I'm going to go ahead and answer your question. So if you come up to me after the service and you say, so you're saying to me that if I don't believe in Jesus and trust in Jesus alone for my salvation, then I'm going to face the judgment of God. Yes, that's what I'm saying. That's what the Bible is teaching. You say, well, that's, 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 that's some rough words. Well, I hadn't got to the rest of the Psalm yet. Before I do, I want to quote Spurgeon. These are terrible words and teachers do not do well who endeavor by their sophisticated reasoning to weaken their force. Reader, never tolerate slight thoughts of hell or you will soon have low thoughts of sin. Now I want you to hear me, brothers and sisters. The reason that sin has infiltrated the church like it never has in this part of the world is because we have ceased to talk and to think about the judgment of God. We have bought the cultural lie that we don't ever need to talk about that, that we don't ever need to think about that. So I just want to ask those of you who are bothered right now and want to leave and several have already, but (laughs) I have a question for you. If judgment is coming, and I know it's coming, what is the loving thing for me to do for you? To pretend it's not? To tell you you're okay? Or is the loving thing to do to tell you this is coming? And that God has provided a way of deliverance. He says, you will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. Appear. That's how how it's described in the New Testament, in the appearance of Christ. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath. The fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring among the children of man. And this goes destroy, swallow is a form of destroy, consume is a form of destroy. And then, and, the, and then the ESV translates the next word destroy. So you're going to destroy completely, surrounding them in this destruction of wrath, like fire consuming them. And here's how ultimate this destruction is going to be of the wicked, of the evil, of the enemy of God. There will never be another descendant of them again. God is going to eliminate them forever. They will never replicate themselves again after this moment. Psalm 2 says, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Verse 11 says, They Though they plan evil against you, though they deceive, devise mischief, they will not succeed. It's nothing new for people to say, well, you know, the, all that religious stuff, that's just got people bound up. People need to be free. You need to express yourself. You need to be who you are. Don't, don't let anybody hold you down. There's just absolute insanity going on in the world right now. It's it's crazy, but hear me. It will not succeed. That's what the Bible says right here. It will not succeed. Give you an illustration. There's a group of people in Western China, Mongolia, called the Uyghurs. Some of you may have prayed for the Uyghurs. It's one of the people groups I've prayed for. The communist government, they're some of the most devout Muslims in China. And the Chinese government has decided they won't rid of it. 
They want this, this, this devout form of religion gone. So here's what they've done in towns where Uyghurs are concentrated. They've set up checkpoints. They have this little device. They scan a Uyghur's phone. And if there's any evidence on that phone of religious language or behavior, they're then herded into a concentration or a camp. Excuse me. I'll let you call it what you want to call it. They're concentrating the people in a place to re-educate them. Does this sound familiar? You say, well, why are you, you, why are you talking about Muslims and Chinese government? Here's why. Over the last three or four years, multiple Uyghur have come to faith. Now, I'm not, I don't know the mind of God for sure, but let me just speculate. Wouldn't it just be like God to bring a few Uyghur to faith just before they all get concentrated in one spot? Whatever's happening, here's what I know. They will not succeed. The gospel will go to every tongue and every tribe and every nation and every land. There will be people joyfully rejoicing at the coming of Jesus Christ. For all others, it says, you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. And here's what this is saying. For those of you who reject Christianity, for those of you who reject Christ and continue to have your own religious trajectory for your life, here's what the Bible's promising. It's not just a general judgment. He will aim at you. You aim at their faces. That's individual. The end of Psalm 2. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. The question is, have you taken refuge in Christ? We, we, we say this in, in, in evangelical world. I've been saved. I have a question from you. From what? From what? I took a job one time. We were at lunch. Guy found out I wanted to be a preacher. Guy looks at me. He said, I've been saved. I said, okay. He said, man, I, I've been saved. I've been saved three times. I said, from what? Drowning? Here's what you've been saved from. The wrath of of God. Your sin must be dealt with. God didn't just go, oh, forget it. No. He sent his son in humility who hung in your place and bore your sin and the wrath of God in your place that you might be saved. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, here's my so what question. Is the Lord's strength displayed in Christ the King through his cross and resurrection, eliciting, bringing about glad rejoicing and confident trust in me? Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. So the trajectory of the psalm is that Christ's joy is our joy. So when God set Christ free from the grave, he saved us. He set us free from the grave. Now our lives are bound up with his. His victory is our victory. His joy is our joy. When the king wins, we win. Psalm 8, 5. Yet you have made him a little lower than heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. Now, the, the Psalm 8, 5 puts this tension in here that God became man. You made him a little lower than angels. He became a man. Completely God, completely man, so that he could be the perfect sacrifice. And because he is the perfect sacrifice, you have crowned him with glory and honor. Now, Philippians chapter 2. This is how it gets described. By Paul, 
You see how he follows the same outline of, Roman, of Psalm 8, 5. You have made him a little lower than heavenly beings. You have crowned him with glory and honor. Watch what he does. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not con- count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. The, the creator of life died. And he died humiliate, in a humiliation, even death on a cross. Therefore, because of what he has done on the cross and the victory of the resurrection, therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. So let me summarize the Bible. Let me summarize Psalm 21 right now. Christ alone purchased salvation. You can never buy it yourself. You can never earn it yourself. Christ alone purchased salvation. Number two. Christ alone demands our praise. He wins. He is one. And in us, in us, we say, be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. Because of your power, you you deserve to be exalted. And because of your power, because of your strength and the joy over it, we will sing and praise. What does it say? Your power. We will sing and praise your power. So, brothers and sisters, I want to invite you together now in just a moment. For all those who know the Lord Jesus Christ, to express your joy over him in worship and to sing and praise his power. And for those of you who are not believers, I want to explain to you what Philippians 2 is teaching you. You're going to bow to Jesus. You're going to. The reason the Bible describes weeping and gnashing of teeth is that's going to be people who break their teeth off because they're being forced to say something they didn't want to say. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Here's the difference. One will do it with weeping and gnashing. The other will do it with joy. You have heard the gospel today. Will you repent of your sin and trust in the victorious Christ to save you, that you might know him. There are going to be pastors here while we're singing. You can come talk to them. I'll be available out in the lobby. Or you can reach out to me through using social media or email or whatever. I want to have a conversation with you. Let's pray. Lord, as we bow together, we confess that you alone have won the victory. And that you and you alone share that victory with us by faith. I pray now that your children, this kingdom of priests that you have called together, would glorify you as you have created them to do. And for those who have yet to bow their knee and trust in Christ, I pray for the power of conviction, Holy Spirit, upon them that they will not rest until they repent and turn to you. Pour out your spirit on us as we worship you. Glorify yourself in this place, we pray. In Jesus' name.